Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who got a six-pack for his girlfriend and still considers it to be the greatest trade in his life. He is the captain. Well, she wasn't even worth the recycle refund fee. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Imperial Confession by 1940s Brewing Company. This is an Imperial Double Oatmeal Stout that is barrel-aged in Woodford Reserve Bourbon Barrels, garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And here's some cheers to our good friends and contributors to this week's beer fun. First up, we have Lindsay Barber in Cambridge, Ontario. That's in Canada, Captain. I know. I love our brothers and sisters up north. And a big shout out to Josh in Lincoln, Nebraska. Next up, here's a cheers to Pedro in San Marcos, Texas. Vote for Pedro. Oh, in one of my favorite cities, Kalamazoo, Michigan, we have Joy. Next up, we have Olha in Dallas, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have our friends over at the Readery. Cheers to everyone that helped out with this week's beer fund. If you want to contribute to next week's beer run, Go to TrueCrimeGarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N on Beer Run. And for all of our old episodes, check us out on the Stitcher app. They are free. And we also have a bonus show called Off the Record. Check that out as well. That's on Stitcher Premium. And that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Back in June of 1979, Kimberly Niece borrowed her father's pickup truck to go to town on a Friday night. She was seen cruising the drag in Poplar, Montana, several hours before her body was discovered. In episode one, we went through in detail the tragic and brutal murder of a promising young woman and the bungled crime scene investigation that followed. But then police almost out of nowhere Get someone who confesses to killing Kimberly Niece. This is three and a half years after the murder. And what is even more strange, the confession comes from all the way down in Monroe, Louisiana. In January of 1983, our old pal Barry Beach, he's down there at the police station Mm -hmm. in Monroe, Louisiana. He was originally brought in for some kind of minor offense. But the result is he confesses to killing Kimberly niece plus three other people Mm. during the three and a half years between when Kimberly was killed and Barry was arrested. Barry beach was bouncing back and forth between Montana and Louisiana while down there, his father's wife. So his stepmother calls in a complaint to the law enforcement agency down there. She says Barry was assisting his stepsister and her friends in running away from home and possibly skipping school. So he's picked up for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. During this time period, though, the main concern of the police down there is a serial murderer who is on the loose and killing women in the area. Two women and a girl were killed, and they had just put together a task force to hunt down this killer. Now, we got to keep in mind what is going on in the world at this very moment. Remember, up the road from Louisiana, from 1979 to 1981, Wayne Williams was killing kids in Atlanta, Georgia. He's convicted of two, suspected of maybe 25, and, well... I believe Wayne Williams killed 15 or 16 of those people in my humble garage opinion. Now, these three murders in Louisiana started up in August of 1980. And there's another murder in April of 81. And then again in February of 1982. Wayne Williams was on trial in Georgia at this time, at the time of the third murder. Police formed a task force and 
the phrase another Atlanta became common discussion around town. Police announced that the murders were connected, but were tight-lipped otherwise. After the third murder, even police and detectives were now saying publicly, I think we may have another Atlanta on our hands. Mm -hmm. So Captain, police likely are telling Beach's stepmother, look, lady, we'll write this guy a ticket and move on because we have a serial killer here and we've got bigger fish to fry. Mm -hmm. And Beach's stepmother, because she is just such a nice and helpful person, tells police, well, that's interesting because Barry was questioned a couple of times about a murder of a 17-year-old girl back in his hometown before he moved here. Well, I mean, look, he did come home covered in blood the night a girl was murdered in his very small town. Can we agree it's a questionable statement? We have an officer who says he took a statement from a woman who says, my teenage son was covered in blood, yet there's no record of that statement anywhere other than this guy's this guy saying He Mm -hmm. took that statement and the mother saying, I never gave that statement. Right. So it's a little, it's a little dicey on if it were, if it's true or not. But, but yeah, I hear you out. I hear you. So now police are like, oh, right. This guy, he's questioned back in his tiny little town of Poplar. And then he moves here. And now all of a sudden we've got three murdered females. And we know he's a real son of a beach. (laughs) Shout out to Howard Stern there. And it turns out one of the women murdered in Louisiana, well, there's some connection between her and Barry. They knew each other. The sheriff's office contacted the Roosevelt County Sheriff's Office back in Montana and confirmed that Beach was, in fact, a bona fide suspect in that unsolved murder, the unsolved murder of Kimberly Neese. With Roosevelt County's blessing the sheriff's office down in louisiana we have sergeant j via and commander alfred and commander alfred calhoun they questioned beach at the sheriff's office several different times for several hours each time beach initially denied killing niece and he denied any involvement in the three louisiana murders as well I really don't like when they're questioning for lengthy periods. I think we've seen that time and time again go, go wrong. Yeah. And, but what we're going to end up getting is a confession on several different levels here. As said, he will eventually confess to killing the three Louisiana victims and confess to killing Kimberly niece as well. I want to just focus on the portion of the Kimberly niece case before things. I don't want things to get too convoluted, right? We got to be able to, to, to walk through this and follow it as clear as possible. Barry Beach's confession to the killing of Kimberly niece basically goes like this. He was partying with his two friends in a place called Sandy Beach on the afternoon of June 15th, 1979. This is when Beach said he got his car stuck in the sand. Then he ruined his transmission trying to get it out. In a fit of anger, he yells at his friends. He ends up punching the vehicle. And about at about 4.30 p.m., he left his friends and walked back to town. There, he asked a couple of friends to drive him home. The first people that he asked, well, they turned him down. The second car that he asked, they actually drove him home. Once he got home, he says that he took a nap and didn't wake up until sometime after it was already dark. When he did wake up, he got dressed, and he walked into town, and he says that he saw Kim sitting alone in her truck at the Exxon gas station. Mm Mm-hmm. Barry Beach asked Kim if she knew where her sister Pam was. Remember, he was kind of dating Pam at the time. She says, I I don't know what answer she she gives to this question. It's not clear in the statements that he provided to police. But the result is he ends up asking Kim if he could ride with her, ride around town and hang out with her. Mm Mm-hmm. He says that she agreed to this. So they drove around aimlessly 
around the tiny little town of Poplar for a while before parking at the train bridge. And this is where Kim's vehicle, the truck, would later be found. Mm -hmm. Kim and Barry sat in her truck, according to Barry, talking for some time, talking about the normal kid crap, right? Talking about high school, Kim going off to college after the summer, Pam and Barry's relationship, and Kim and Greg's relationship, normal stuff. Eventually, after some beers, they smoke a joint and continue talking. Barry steers the conversation away from Pam and him to maybe something with Kim and him. Kim doesn't seem to like this idea. Barry tells her he wants to have sex with her. She turns him down. He tries to touch her. She pushes him away. He tries to kiss her. She pushes him away and tells him to get out of the truck. Barry calms her down and offers to smoke some more weed with her. Mm. He says in his confession, he thought if she got a little messed up, she might change her mind. Yeah. After joint number two, Barry is going to give it another shot. And of course he shot down. And this time Kim is having no more of his shenanigans, no more of his rude, aggressive behavior. And as he tries to touch her again, he, this, this again, after she has refused all of his advances, she smacks him. Barry says he smacks her back. The no. detective inquires further. Did you smack her with your hand or your fist? Barry says with his fist. So he describes this as if maybe one could believe it's some kind of I don't know, maybe some kind of fight or even even if just briefly some kind of fight. Mm -hmm. And we know that he certainly is going to have the upper hand here. He's using his fist and then he does this weird thing of still making these advances to her. At some point he says he saw a crescent wrench on the floorboard inside the truck. He picks it up. He hits Kim several times with it. Kim tries to escape out the driver's side. Right, so you're you're saying that he's claiming, I, I tried to make these advancements uh, towards her. She didn't respond. Then I tried to get her more drunk and high. Maybe then she would respond to my advances. She didn't. Uh, then she physically attacked me, so then I attacked her, but then he continued to make advances after he's yep. pun punched her. This is according to the confession that, that, uh, mm. that is had in this case. He says that he saw that crescent wrench on the floorboard inside the truck. He picked it up and hit Kim several times with it. He said that she tried to escape out the driver's side of the vehicle. Barry got out. He runs around to her mm. and he pins her up against the side of the truck. He says he tries to kiss her again, and this is when she scratched him. Well, at this point, he's he's trying to rape her. Well, that's right. And, and you know, I said this weird thing of, hey, he's physically abusing her, but then still tries these sexual adv advances. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that that's a weird thing, but you got to keep in mind that a lot of experts say that rape is more about power and control than the actual intercourse itself. Barry mm -hmm. keeps going back to trying to kiss her because in his pea brain, he believes at some point she may comply. He hits her to get what he wants. This makes him feel powerful. She does what he wants, even if forced to do so. This gives him a sense of control. And in turn, again, having control or being in control, mm -hmm. this makes him, this makes his weak minded attack feel like, like he's some kind of powerful man. Mm-hmm. Barry says at some point he did choke Kim. This seems to be rather brief because he then grabs a tire iron from the bed of the truck and he started beating her in the head with it and eventually she stops moving. So we have an attack with the crescent wrench, his fist. That started inside the truck, no, no right. doubt. And then we have this tire iron that would have been used outside of the, the truck. After she stops moving, he realized that he killed her. 
He says that he started to panic. He decided that he needed to get rid of the evidence. He found a large garbage bag in the truck and tried to put Kim in this garbage bag. She only partially fit in the bag. So he dragged her over to the river and pushed her in. He then took the keys from the truck, the crescent wrench, and the tire iron and tossed them into the river as well. He says he used his shirt to try to wipe off fingerprints in and around the truck. Barry, then his goal was to go home, to run home, but he's covered in blood. So he says that he stripped down to his underwear, wiped the blood off his body as best as he could. He burns his clothes in a railroad car that it's parked on the tracks. Mm -hmm. He ran the rest of the way home, washed the remaining blood off, and then he goes to sleep the whole time trying to convince himself that none of this really happened. Well, but so we we can also assume that maybe that his mother seeing him covered in blood actually did happen. Or are we just thinking that that's still I don't know. Rumor. I don't know what to think. I wish that there was some actual report of that statement that the officer says that that he got from his mother. Is that the end of his confession? That's basically the end of his confession, yes. he. I mean, the thing that I find interesting here mm. is it matches up pretty nice with the evidence, and it matches up pretty nice with the things and the items at the crime scene. Mm-hmm. Well, the Crescent Ranch, but it's such a small town that you would think that he would have known possibly about that uh, tire iron, something you find on a vehicle. So, you know, it's not that far fetched for somebody to come up with that, that idea. Well, that's what's going to be at the crux of this whole argument Hmm. and at the center of this whole case against Mr. Barry beach, because the people against Barry beach will say, look how much of the confession lines up with what we know went down that night. Mm Mm-hmm. We know she was at the Exxon gas station. He says he saw her there, and that's where he got in the truck. We know that the truck was found at the train bridge. We know that she was dragged from the truck. We know that she was beaten with at least two items. We know that the attack started or or took place inside the truck as well as outside of the truck. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't say that he rapes her, and there there's no there's no evidence of rape. So there's a lot of things that are in his story that did, in fact, take place during the commission of this homicide. So this confession looks really good. But as you just pointed out, very astutely, I might point, I might uh, add, Mm -hmm. is small town. It's three and a half years later. There are certain details of this homicide that probably were rumored about town, put in the paper. Uh, I know that the... uh, she wasn't raped was put in the paper. I, I read the article myself that says that. But but what's interesting, though, to me is, and I, I keep bringing it, it seems like I keep bringing up the P- Pike County murders, which at some point we should cover, but having friends from that area and, and it being a case not solved, and yes, it's a bigger case, there's more people murdered uh, in that, you know, horrific event, But there was tons of speculation and tons of rumor that people thought were facts. So the fact that nothing in his confession that you told me, there's not one thing that is wrong. Right. There's nothing that dismisses him. Right. And I guarantee you, again, stuff that we're not privy to. Okay. Well, well, we know she wasn't raped. We know she was dumped in in the water. We know that her where her truck was found. Okay, great. This is information that everybody's going to know in that town. But what were the other rumors? What were the other speculations in that town that he conveniently left out? Or maybe not conveniently. Maybe it's because this is this is the killer. I mean, there's not a lot of people in that town, especially in that age bracket. He's the same age as her. And he's basically... At least with the confession, he's putting himself in the general location 
with no alibi. Yeah, he. I mean, he lives near the, somewhat near the the murder scene. Right. He also, you know, we we I failed to mention the fact that he says he threw the murder weapons and the the keys to the truck in the river. We know that the keys were not found. We know that the pathologist says, "Hey, look, I I believe more than one weapon was used, but I don't know what weapons that, that were used." And that's because the murder weapons were not found. So there's a lot of things that really line up here. And he's not just some wacko coming out of the woodwork, you know, coming out of the, out of nowhere, thin air here. He's somebody that was an actual suspect at one time years ago, shortly after the murder. And I wonder if the Crescent Wrench information was put out there, but that would be something that he would have access to because he was dating her sister. Or at least spending time with his sister, and so is it possible that then he then talked to her uh, afterwards to get more details about about the crime? Well, if the family even had any of the details other than what was outside of the paper, we know that the father said that there was a wrench missing. Yes, he did. the uh, The sheriff's department down there they also managed to get Barry, as we said, to confess to their three unsolved homicides the three murders in Louisiana. But there's a bit of a problem here for law enforcement down there because even though he confessed to those three homicides, he couldn't have committed them as there was proof that he was not in their state. He was not in Louisiana for two, maybe even all three of the murders. Mm. And the police down there already said all three were connected. So, What's going to happen is he's no longer good for these down here, even though he confessed to him. But while down here, he confessed to a murder up in Montana. So let's ship this guy back to Montana to face the music. Barry immediately argues that his confessions were coerced. He claimed that he was threatened. He claimed that he was manipulated. He claimed that he was drugged. But even with the bungled crime scene, the confession was enough for a jury up in Montana to convict him. He was sentenced to 100 years with no chance of parole. Please note the following regarding this confession. The tape of Barry Beach's confession, according to law enforcement in Monroe, Louisiana, had been erased. So at his trial, he's saying, look, you can't, you can't use my conf- confession to convict me. It was coerced. Mm-hmm. All that law enforcement can provide, all that the prosecution can provide to the, the jury and the judge is a typed up confession, a transcript of the questioning between police and Barry Beach. I mean, you could, I could type up something and who knows if it was actually said or not. Mm -hmm. When you lose the audio tape, Beach maintained that his confession was coerced. What do you mean by that? Well, he says that when he was down there in Louisiana, they kept threatening him with the death penalty with the electric chair. And he resorted to, well, maybe if I confess, they're talking to me about these, this Montana case. Now, maybe if I confess to this, they'll ship me back up to Montana. I don't want to be in Louisiana. I don't want the the death penalty or the the electric chair that these guys are telling me that they're going to watch me fry on for these three murders. Right. But I guess he wasn't aware that he had a solid alibi. What's that? Was he not aware that he had a solid alibi? Well, that's what's weird. I don't know why he even bothered to confess to the Louisiana cases at some point i mean they're they're questioning him and at some point it gets down to he he starts to get confused and he's saying like thing they're talking about god and god is telling him that he did it i mean it gets really weird the whole interaction between these two interrogators and i (laughs) i'm choosing to call them interrogators because that's what it seems like at this point and barry beach And I'm not willing to say he's perfectly innocent of anything here, Captain. I'm just saying the interaction that I read between these three 
was very strange and it, and it seemed odd. Now, it didn't seem to me, though, he, he's not being denied any of his rights. He was made well aware of his Miranda rights several times. So the officers did that and did that thoroughly and correctly. But the, the whole God conversation gets weird and he admits to these three murders that they end up knowing that he did not con, you know, confess. He, he could not have committed these murders. And then to top that off, these two same officers later got two other, at least two other men to confess to these three murders in Louisiana as well. And it was proved that they did not kill these three women. Well, and like you said there, it's an interrogation. Their job is to try to get a confession, not to try to get the truth. Right. So what I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out what could be good and make, make good and point to Barry Beach's confession being real and truthful. And he is a killer. But I'm also pointing out that these two individuals, these two officers, seem to be skilled at getting people to confess to things that we know they did not do. So in the mess of all of that, did they perhaps get Barry Beach to confess to killing Kimberly Neese? And in fact, he did not do it. So many people question not only the evidence, but the prosecutorial conduct during the course of Barry Beach's trial. And even after the trial, the rumors persisted around Poplar, Montana, that a group of girls were the ones responsible for Kim's murder. Other than the confession Barry gave to the detectives, which again, he says was coerced, that was really the only thing that convicted him of the murder of Kim Neese. At the time, prosecution did say that they had a hair that matched Barry Beach. And we now know all these years later through science that unless that hair has DNA on it and you match it to his DNA, it's not a 100% match, although that's what it was presented as in court. But none of the fingerprints, none of the palm prints, none of the other physical evidence at the crime scene could be matched to Barry Beach. All right. Cheers, mates. Cheers, Captain. Well, we have Barry Beach sitting in prison. He's sentenced to 100 years. He says, I was wrongfully convicted. And he requests the help of Centurion Ministries, who agreed to research his case after their investigators reviewed the facts of the case and noticed an absence of physical evidence in this case. So there's not physical evidence tying beach to the actual murder. Right. They formally took on the case in 2000 In doing so they conducted an exhaustive reinvestigation of Barry beach's conviction. Centurion ministries was according to their website, the first organization in the world dedicated to the vindication of wrongly convicted persons since 1983, they have freed 63 men and women who were serving life or death sentences for crimes they did not commit. Centurion believed that the confessions obtained in Louisiana were coerced and that the group of girls actually murdered Kim Neese. One significant witness that Centurion managed to find in their investigation was a woman named Stephanie Eagleboy. She told a story that when she was 10 years old, she lived near the train bridge at this time in Poplar back in 1979. She liked to sit out on a rock overlooking the train bridge with her cousin. One night in 1979, they were sitting on this rock when they saw two pickup trucks pull onto the train bridge. They say that a group of girls got out and they heard about 10 or 20 minutes of what they labeled as horrific screaming mm. and girls shouting things like get her and kick the bitch. Then it got quiet. They say that they saw, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say they, 
just Stephanie Eagle Boy, mm -hmm. says that she saw a police car arrive, and she knows that it's a police car because it had its the police lights on top on. So old Eagle Boy has an eagle eye. Well, the the cop shuts off the lights, according to Stephanie's story. Mm -hmm. Then she heard what she thought was digging noises. Then the all three vehicles leave and drive off. Okay, this is interesting. She does say, hey, I was scared. I was 10. I was scared of the girls. I was scared of police. I was scared of everybody. I didn't tell anybody all the way back then. I'm willing to tell people now. Doyle points out in his book that he does not believe that Stephanie witnessed the Kimberly niece murder. He says that he does not think that she's lying. She just witnessed something else. Something else. You're exactly right. Because he points out a couple of different things. One, Kim's truck stayed at the scene. According to the story that Stephanie Eagle Boy, whatever she witnessed, she says all of the vehicles left after this screaming and this attack seemed to go down. And the other thing, too, is that, that, that Doyle points to is that Stephanie's cousin has never said at any time, stated on any official record, that she saw anything that Stephanie has described seeing right. back in 1979. So, again, we're not saying that she is lying. We're just saying she, it might be just a simple mistake of having witnessed something else at a different time. We're not saying that she's lying. We're just saying she's lying. Well... Speak for yourself. I, I don't, <laughs> just not on purpose. I, I've seen I've seen this uh, woman interviewed, and I I believe that she saw what she said she saw. I just mm -hmm. don't think it has anything to do. I'm I'm on the side of Doyle there. I don't think it has anything to do with Kimberly's case. Right now, Captain, for this next part, I'm really going to give the short of it, the just the facts, ma'am, somewhat the wiki version of all of the legal stuff here, because there's a lot of it. And I want to make sure that we save some time to get back to those cases in Louisiana because they are important to this story. Mm -hmm. So late in 2011, a judge issued a ruling that there was clear and convincing evidence that a jury could find Barry Beach innocent. So he was granted a new trial. As a result of this, Barry Beach was released from prison. I want to point out this is after years and years of of legal things back and forth. So he's released from prison after nearly three decades behind bars. Barry was free to go out, do his thing. This is pending a new trial. Barry found employment working as the head of maintenance at a hotel. But a year and a half later... In May of 2013, the Montana Supreme Court reinstated the murder conviction, mm -hmm. this overturning the latest ruling. And so Barry was not going to get a new trial. And in fact, he was ordered to resume his life sentence immediately. I keep saying life sentence. It was technically not a life sentence. He was sentenced to 100 years in prison. Right, right. That same day, Barry surrendered himself to the authority. So now... Out of prison, back in prison. In October, suck. yeah, in October of 2014, Beach's attorneys asked Montana Sp Supreme Court to order that Beach be resentenced. Okay, this is important. The Supreme Court asked the state to respond to his attorney's claim that Beach's 100 year sentence is illegal because the trial court did not consider that Beach was a minor at the time of Nisa's killing and because it leaves no opportunity for release. All right. The, the way that this breaks down is if you were to, the, the, the not receiving a life sentence sucks for Barry Beach mm -hmm. because the life sentence actually carries different weight than the 100 year sentence. The 100 year sentence with good behavior gets Barry Beach out at the earliest after 52 and a half years of serving time. He was in his 20s at the time. He would have been nearly 75, 80 years old by the time he would get out per absolute perfect, good, good record while in prison, good behavior. That's the earliest he could get out. He could potentially get out slightly earlier under the rules of a life sentence. But then on top of that, they're saying the 
shortly after he was convicted, he was actually 17 when the murder took place. He was a child. Mm. And Montana did not allow for juveniles to receive life sentences. So Mm. he should not have been sentenced to that lengthy of a sentence. It's a whole long legal thing here, argument back and forth. And Beach's attorney is simply pointing out that he was a teenager at the time, and there was legal precedent that says teens should not be handed that life sentence. The Montana Attorney General's office says this precedent does not extend to murder cases. Mm. So on November 20th of 2015, again, after a whole lot of back and forth, Montana Governor Steve Bullock commuted the sentence to time served plus 10 years probation. So as of less than five years ago, Barry Beach is out of prison and he's still serving probation. He's, he's served quite a bit of time for this murder. Now the question then becomes, do you think he did it or he didn't do it? Yeah. It's very strange, especially with the, cause we have evidence or we, assume it's correct evidence that he confessed to three murders that he didn't do. Right. So it's not a big stretch to go, well, maybe he confessed to this fourth one as well and he didn't do it. But then you go back to the Mm -hmm. problem of he got an awful lot of things, awful lot of things right in his confession. Yeah. And he has a connection to her. I think that's the, that's another big thing. They were the same age. They went to school together. They knew each other. Um, no, well, not even just that. I mean, he dated her sister. Dated That's, the sister. And they, they were known to be quite close when they were little kids as well. Mm-hmm. I do want to point out some things that I think is wrong with Centurion Ministries case. Because I I don't really know what they were basing this off of. I, I, I agree with them on the statement, hey, your, what you said about this hair matching Barry Beach at the time of his trial, that's completely, that's a farce. That's completely incorrect. You cannot say that it 100% matched him. We know that nowadays without DNA connecting it to him, it's not a 100% match. So that was, that's questionable behavior. Well, mat- right. But it matches on some level. It, he cannot be excluded. Right. As the providing the sample of that hair at the crime scene. However, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of other people, if not thousands of people, couldn't be excluded from having left that at the crime scene as well. The other thing, though, too, is let's talk about some of the leaps that I believe that they presented or, or were attempting to present in their their defense of Mr. Barry Beach. One was that the statement in it, they, they want to tear apart his confession. Right. They want to say, well, his confession can't be correct because of this thing and this thing that he stated. The first being that Kim would not have gave Barry Beach a ride. They were in different social classes. That's their statements. I find that to be that makes my head spin. I go, what do you mean different social classes? They lived in the same neighborhood. This is a town of less than 900 people. They went to the same school. They were the same age. He dated her sister. Yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> what? Even even if it's different classes, it's the fact that he was dating or had some kind of relationship with her sister that she would have helped him out. I think what's more interesting to point to that that portion, portion of his confession might be false is that no one ever says that they saw Barry Beach with Kim Neese. Mm-hmm. We have witnesses say, hey, I saw her parked alone. I saw her sitting by herself, multiple witnesses, but nobody at any time ever saying they saw Barry Beach with Kim. But nobody saw her down uh, where her car was found parked by herself. Yeah, you're right. The only person saying that they saw her down there is Barry Beach. Right, and that's that's where we know her car ended up. But also, we also have eyewitnesses that say, we saw her at the gas station by herself. And then we have Barry Beach saying, yep, and that's when I came upon her and then for, for, for a ride. The other thing they point out too, captain is that they, in his confession, he states that Kim scratched her, him during the attack. Mm-hmm. And it's too bad. She didn't rip off his dick. You know, that would just make the story a little bit better. Centurion ministry says that this cannot be true 
because there there was no skin found under her fingernails at the autopsy. Okay, that is a true statement. Where I have a problem with it is I reviewed the entire 22-page autopsy. It doesn't mention her fingernails once in the entire autopsy. Right. So it may, it's, yes, it's true that no finger, no skin was found under her fingernails at the autopsy, but we don't even know that they were examined or checked for skin. Right. And how long was she actually in the water for? And yeah, and would that have an effect on removing any of that evidence? Again, I'm just, I'm just saying that's, it's an exaggeration. Right. So we have that part, right, Captain? I mean, you can't say there was no skin found under the fingernails. They're not saying in the autopsy report, we examined the fingernails and there was no skin found. It's it's not stated anywhere in the report anything about fingernails. Well, and maybe I think what the defense is trying to say is since it wasn't stated, then obviously they didn't find anything. And that's just not the case. That's correct. So then we also have a couple of other possibilities. Look, I, I'm not willing to remove Barry Beach as a likely suspect in this case. I think he's still, even though he's out and they've determined that it's time served, that's a key thing here too, time served. They're not saying that he's innocent either. They're just saying he's if he did the crime, well, he's done the time. And now he's out. I think he looks just as good as anybody else, but we also have other people to consider, right? If he didn't do it, as he says, and as Centurion Ministry says, then somebody else had to have killed Kimberly Neese. Mm -hmm. We have this ongoing rumor for many, many years, for decades now, that a group of girls killed Kim Neese that night. We have a statement that was given to the sheriff's office. This is three weeks after the murder. A guy named Mike, this is, this comes from a um, an individual that says, a guy named Mike told him several people beat Kim to death and there were several witnesses and no one helped her. When asked who was doing the beating, he said it was Sissy Atkinson and Tara Red Dog or something. Now, we know Sissy Atkinson. She is in this story. She's referenced many times. Uh, the only mention I ever saw of this Tara Red Dog is in this young man's statement to the sheriff's department. But he follows that up with or something. So it sounds like he's not clear on the second individual's name. Mike Longtree said that Red Dog held Kim down while Sissy beat her with a hammer or some other object. Kim's hair was caked in blood. She begged for help before she fell and passed out. And then people started to leave the area, leave the scene. We know that a claw hammer was found in the river 30 feet from the body found by scuba uh, scuba diver during evidence search. Yeah, it was found by scuba Steve. But the pathologist says that that was not the instrument that killed Kim. I do want to point out, though, that, Captain, there's been a long list or a long roster of names when it comes to the quote-unquote group of girls involved in the murder of Kim Neese. Well, I've I, seen probably six or seven different names. Uh, the ones that are mostly tied to it is the Sissy Atkinson, Maude Greyhawk, and Joanne Todd. Um yeah, but that that story doesn't account for that there's an attack in the vehicle and out of the vehicle, right? Just What's the, that? The way that that account of the story went. So this young man is not claiming to have witnessed the murder. He's just saying that he's heard he heard about he's, it. He's he's citing by name an individual that told him what that person witnessed that night. Again, the, the, we have the rumor, and and normally when there's more people than one involved, you'll get people talking about it. People can't be quiet about it. And the other thing too, is I don't know that you can completely rule out the boyfriend at the time. I mean, there's really a whole long list of suspects that, that I don't think you can clear. And a lot of that is based off of, you just don't have very good physical evidence. Yeah. 
we do we do have I thought I thought this was weird when I was uh going through the police reports. There was a report from a person named Johnny McClammy, and he says that on the night that Kim Neese was murdered, he witnessed a pickup truck pull up at the Norgard house between 335 and 345 a.m. Okay. In his report, in his statement to the sheriff's office, he says that he knows that it was either 335 or 345 a.m. because immediately after he witnessed this truck pull up at the Norgard house, he looked at two clocks inside of his house. One said 335, one said 345. Mm. He said that the pickup, he described the pickup as having loud mufflers and a bar or a rack on the back. I find this to be interesting. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could just be a coincidence. But I find it interesting that we have all of this activity going on with all these teenagers. Greg is the closest one to our murder victim. And he says that he gets home between 2.45 and 3 a.m. What is this vehicle pulling up at 3.35, 3.45 a.m.? Mm-hmm. where I'm getting at and what I'm, where I'm going at with this is this whole story, this, this rumor that's lasted for decades about a group of girls. Well, that's not what the statement was that was given to the, the sheriff's office, the sheriff's office statement that they received from that, that young man, the, the witnesses said he was told by Mike Longtree that Mike Longtree witnessed the murder was that a group of people were there. This could include guys and other dudes that it didn't have to just be girls. The way that it sounds that it went down is it might be a couple of girls that were responsible for the actual murder, Mm -hmm. but there were plenty of witnesses there. And this being both, you know, young, young women, girls, guys, what have you. It is possible that they might not even have known that they actually killed her. I think I think the 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 more troubling thing and then where I question this rumor is I don't know why I I just find it somewhat hard to believe if the more people that you put at that scene the more people that you that that you have that claim to have witnessed something or know or have heard something mm-hmm. none of these people ever came forward when they're convicting the wrong guy for the murder yeah, but again, that's I think those are little details not being privy to because you're not from the area. You don't know what kind of relationship that uh, you know Mr. Beach had with anybody, and 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 what kind of you know individual he was. And it could be as sick as you know these um, girls uh, attack her for whatever reason, jealousy or. Maybe she's flirting yeah. with their. The the claim is that they that one of them, at least one of them, was jealous. Probably several of them, but it seems like there may have been something going on or something suspected of going on between Sissy Atkinson, I believe, or one of these other young young women. Again, it's a long ever-changing fluid yeah, roster of names it, right but it's not that far-fetched we already know that she was hanging out with a guy the night before until four o'clock in the morning right and, and the, the rumor was that that she was hanging out with the not only the boyfriend of one of these girls but the the father of their child but what i'm saying is if that went down and then these guys these detectives and a whole nother part of the country that are pretty good at getting people to confess to crimes gets this guy to confess. Uh, that's like good for you. Why would you come forward? And and the group doesn't have to be that large. Two or three girls, two or three guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, yet, I, I don't, I don't know that. I'm just, I, it just, if that is in fact the truth, it makes me incredibly, it makes me equally as disappointed as I am with the the false confession. It's just weird because I think the confession there's too many details that make sense and there and I also think normally when you have a confession that's false that you have moments of distancing yourself 
from certain things. And and he's like keeps reiterating like, yeah, I attacked her and then I like try to kiss her again. And then I hit her and then I try to kiss her again. Like it's almost like he didn't even have the concept of how crazy of a person that makes him sound. Well, and that's where the audio tape that magically disappeared or was taped over or erased would have been very helpful for the defense. Right. It was a race because of the tactics they use, but that doesn't mean that the confession is false. Just, you know, if you, if you tell somebody, Hey, if, if you lie to me, I'm going to chop off your fingers. You're not supposed to do that. But if you do that and the person confesses and it's truthful, am I making any sense there? No, you're making sense. No. It, it absolutely could still be a truthful confession. What I mean is, would you have ever got a conviction to, to begin with? Right. Because we have nothing to to go off of on that confession and, and how, look, we can sit here all day long and go, yeah, he got a whole bunch of stuff right in the confession. Well, he, you know, he got a million times more things right than Jesse Miss Kelly got in his confession that was put pieced together. But we also don't know that maybe these investigators, maybe these interrogators received detailed information about the murder scene, about the crime itself right. from investigators back in Montana, and they helped Barry piece it together and really helped him hang himself with, with hit quote unquote his words. And all we have is a piece of paper that's typed out by God knows who to tell us this is what Barry said that day when he was being questioned. It would be nice to have that audio tape to hear, were they starting and stopping that tape? Was Barry getting things wrong and then they were manipulating his answers or telling him that he got it wrong? No, try again, Barry. Mm -hmm. Think harder this time, Barry. No. It wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a, a a a hammer that you used. Wasn't there something else that you saw in that truck, Barry? We've seen this go down. We've seen this movie a million times. It, I, I, I do question the validity of the, the confession. And it, let's go back to, to Louisiana. Because what we have here is three guys, Barry included, that confessed to killing these three persons. We have, mm -hmm. We also have a police department that's down there that's kind of freaking out at the moment. They're even publicly stating hey, we think we have another Atlanta on our hands here. We have somebody in our community killing our citizens, and we don't know who it is, but we do know that it's connected. Now, what was interesting about this case was at the time, they said these are connected, but they were very tight-lipped about the details, which I found to be very interesting because I questioned that. I'm like, were they just kind of panicking and these weren't actually connected? Mm -hmm. But what happened was, I'll go through the actual briefly through, through the murders because they released very little about it at the time. The first one was in August of 1980. It was 27 year old victim. Her name was Angie Hill. She was found in Southern Monroe in an industrial park shot in the head. Her car was abandoned. They know that a 22 caliber pistol was used they believe that a possible robbery from a from a convenience store uh, where she worked took place as well, a robbery for $600. And her car was found seven miles away from her body. Then, in April of 81, Kathy Wharton, who went by Jean, she was found, she was 19 years old, found April 4th off of McGuire Ranch Road, and it's the same situation, Captain, where her body is found five miles away from her vehicle. She, too, was shot with a twenty two caliber pistol. And then in February of 82, we have Sherry Alford, who's only 16 years old. She's attacked in a very similar attack. Now, what we learn, how do we know that these are connected? Well, police released all these years later in 2007 that the M.O. was the exact same. And what had happened in all three of these cases is they could determine that by the, the, the vehicles that these young women were driving, right? somebody had bumped them from behind on the road and then ran them off of the road. And once the victim got out of the vehicle or was forced out of the vehicle, then they were sexually assaulted and killed. The bodies dumped away from the vehicle or the vehicle moved away from the, the body, what have you. 
I point all of this out because these cases end up getting closed or at least one of them and police saying that, Hey, these three are connected because in 2007, they connected DNA from the second murder from Kathy Wharton's murder to this guy, Anthony Glenn Wilson, Mm -hmm. Anthony Glenn Wilson has got a rap sheet. Like you wouldn't believe he's been arrested 42 times during his life, booked 32 times in correctional facilities And likely he quit murdering or stopped murdering at least briefly because he was arrested and convicted of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. This in the area of the murders in March 2nd of 1983 in the month of March of 1983. So just one year after the third killing, plus the announcement, the public announcement of the task force forming probably prompted him. The other thing too is, They're putting in the papers, hey, we got this guy, Gary Beach, who looks okay for these. Maybe it's a convenient time for me to quit murdering as well. Right. I point all that out because, it one, it's good to hear that these cases got solved, that that they're not just an aside to the Barry Beach case, to Kimberly Niece's case, as they are often when we see this case on Dateline. That, that we have a result, we have a resolve, an answer to what happened to these poor girls down in Louisiana. But Barry Beach and Anthony Wilson do not look anything like one another. We have an officer who came out. In fact, he was still on the force when they finally solved these three unsolved homicides. He comes forward and he says, hey, When they brought Beach in and said they were going to question him for these three Louisiana murders, we got into a heated argument. I got into a heated argument with the two officers. I said, you know, he doesn't look anything like the description we have of our suspect. Right. We have witnesses at several of the crime scenes of the murder scenes. And we know by all of their accounts, this man looks nothing like, like our suspect. And they said, hey, why don't you shut up? We'll deal with the homicides. You're a narcotics officer. Why don't you worry about the drugs? We'll worry about the homicides. And they questioned Barry Beach anyway. And that's where my mind goes, Captain. And I wonder, you know what? Is this the old bait and switch? As soon as they found out from his old stepmother that Barry was questioned a couple of times up in the state of Montana, hey, let's get him to confess to these three murders here. We know he didn't do it before we even started the questioning. And let's open the door to talk to him about Montana. And let's see what we can get from the investigators up there. Maybe they led him to this confession. To be honest with you, I wish I knew the absolute answer for you, Captain. And I don't have it. I don't have the answer. I've looked over this a hundred times. I can't figure out if Barry Beach's confession is true or false. Oh, we at least know that one of them is false. That's true. That is absolutely true. All right, the crispy of the Colonel E. The extra crispy. The extra saucy crispy. Do we have a, any recommended reading this week? We do, Captain. This week we are recommending a book called Reckless Speculation About Murder. And it's available in paperback and in Kindle form. And that's by... Is this the story of the captain? Well, it could be. And, and it's funny that you say that because I've read this book. It's fantastic. But Reckless Speculation About Murder is kind of what we do every week in the garage. And this is by a good friend of the show, Barney Doyle. One of the things that I enjoyed about this book was it points out that Barney Doyle isn't your average gumshoe private detective. All right, he is. But what sets him apart from all of those other guys is that he wrote this book and they didn't. (laughs) So check out Reckless Speculation About Murder by Barney Doyle. That's our recommended reading for this week. Join us back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it. 